But the Quran fundamentally was an oral tradition, a, mem a me right, memorized right. book. So today we have millions of, of even children uh, who have completely memorized the Quran. Oh my God, so in, in this month now, Ramadan, we do the nighttime prayer. And in this month of Ramadan, they complete the whole Quran. Mm. It's all for memory. So the Imam's not looking into a Quran while he's reading the Quran, basically. So, you know, if he makes a mistake of even a vowel, you'll have people from behind who will correct him. One of the interesting things there is that in the 143rd verse out of the 286, Allah says, and I have chosen for you the middle ground, the middle way. And it's in the middle. And it's the only time that the word middle is used and it's in the middle. Now, no verse numbers, no chapter numbers. Yeah, that's true. That's very memorable. And random verses coming down with events unfolding. And he, the Prophet peace be upon him, is telling them where to put those verses within the entire corpus of the Quran. If the universe can't give birth to itself, then where did it come from? And ultimately, it has to come from something that it, it itself is eternal, pre and post eternal. It cannot have a beginning and it is the explanation for itself. It doesn't require an explanation from outside of it. And so one, once one sort of comes to that conclusion, then one can come forward to revelation and other things and you know, look into that. That, that is the, the tough one, isn't it? Is this about the Quran specifically? Yeah, so, so, yeah, but, so one of the things that uh, are crucially important if one claims that one has revelation is that one should at least establish that it's preserved because otherwise it doesn't matter to some extent. If, if man has changed God's words or the, the claim that some, someone is making that these are God's words, then unless you could decipher which ones are God's words and which ones are man's words, it sort of becomes somewhat moot in terms of following it as a guidance. So one of the things that we try to establish is that there's a lot of academia now that ha is established that seems to, uh, you know, um, solidify the Islamic opinion of preservation. And so at least then that warrants perhaps um, an option to at least look into the scripture. Well, is it actually from God then? Because, you know, okay, it's preserved, fair enough. But preservation by itself doesn't mean that it's necessarily from God, right? And the Quran claims to be a literary miracle, something that cannot be imitated. And it's a rather a bold claim from a man in a desert in the seventh century that, you know, this is a, this is a work that none of you can actually better and none of you can actually, uh, you know, bring anything like it, basically. But the test has actually has stood the time over 14 centuries. Now, what, what was that miracle about the Quran that actually persuaded the, at the time, who were the linguistic masters of the Arabic language? Because rhetoric, um, poetry, these things were very much mastered at that time of, of, of Arab civilization. And there are, there are amazing things that when you look into the Quran, you realize actually it seems implausible that you could explain it through human, human uh, doing or human making. So I'll give you some examples, basically. So you have Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, at the age of 40, known for no literary skills, in fact, known to be illiterate, couldn't read or write. The first book in the Arabic language becomes the Quran. The chapters, 114 chapters, are revealed over 23 years. Many of them consequential to events happening or questions being asked. The order of those chapters is not revealed in order, basically. So it's not chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. You have different chapters being revealed simultaneously. And even the verses within the chapters are not in order. So an event might happen. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, would say, say the verses that were revealed. And then he would say, this pertains to such and such chapter. It goes after those verses and before those verses. So over 23 years, you have over 6,000 verses, the whole book revealed, no editorial process. So there's no checking, there's no counting going on here. 
and the book is complete over, after 23 years, yet it's not compiled in his own lifetime. It's all just down to memory of the people. So the Quran, sorry, my, I'm going to be no, a no, bit no, no, here about um, this, but the Quran was written before uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him. Was... No, no. So it was, so, so not in one book form. So, uh, okay, so, so there was... So the people were writing, there were scribes yeah, who were appointed to write. Yes. But the Quran fundamentally was an oral tradition, a, mem a right, me memorized right. book. So today we have millions of, of even children uh, who have completely memorized the Quran. Oh my God, that's incredible. So in, in this month now, Ramadan, we do the nighttime prayer. And in this month of Ramadan, they complete the whole Quran. Mm. It's all for memory. So the Imam's not looking into a Quran while he's reading the Quran, basically. So you know, if he makes a mistake of even a vowel, you'll have people from behind who will correct him. Because it's memorized basically by millions and millions of people. At the time, we have hundreds of people who memorized the entire Quran. But in the t it, within two years of the Prophet peace him passing away, they decided to compile it as one book in order for potentially people in the future who might not be memorizers to be able to access it. So and he ordered it? The he Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him? So the Prophet, yeah, so the Prophet Muhammad finished the, the, the order of the Qur'an prior to he, him dying. Uh, as you can see, we're at Speaker's Corner today, uh, Alhamdulillah, doing da'wah. Uh, I just wanted to say a big thank you, a jazakallah khair to all of our supporters on Patreon and also all of you who have subscribed to the channel and, and, and are making comments and likes. All of this helps to support the da'wah. And mashallah, the money generally goes towards uh, transcripts, translations and also uh, the shorts that we're doing regularly, alhamdulillah. And all of that is having an impact on spreading the da'wah. So jazakallah khair, inshallah, keep your donations coming and help the da'wah to grow. Jazakallah khair, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Angel Gabriel, we believe, came to him twice in that final year. He used to come every year, but in his final year, he came twice to go over the Quran with him. He then would sit with the companions and he would listen to their Quran and correct them if they needed correcting. But there were a few wars that happened shortly after the Prophet peace him passing away. And so there was a fear that if all the memorizers were killed, then we would have no record of it. So it was then decided by the first and the Khalif to compile it as one book basically uh, and bring it as one Mus'haf. But the fear of potential fear of loss of the memorizers dying never actually happened, so there were still mem hundreds and hundreds of memorizers, but it was just to be safeguarding that potential pro issue or problem that might arise. Um, and I think you started just telling us there was some speculation over the authenticity of some of the passages, or is that... No, so, no, 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 so there's no, there's no issue really about the Qur'an. The Qur'an claims that Allah says in the Qur'an, it is we who have revealed this book, and it is we who shall protect it, guard it from corruption. We believe that that promise has stood the, the test of time. And there's many, as I say, non-Muslim academics that would attest to that. But just going back to the linguistic miracle of the Quran. Now, I told you how it was revealed over 23 years, not any chapter order, not any verse order, and not even compiled at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, as one Mus'haf, one book. There are many aspects of the Quran that you would not expect to find. So for example, Allah mentions man, and he mentions woman. Different places of the Quran, they mention exactly the same number of times. Oh, right. Allah mentions the whole Quran. And how many times would that be roughly? Uh, so I think man and woman, I think it's, it's something like 70. I have it all written down actually, yeah. Wow, that's crazy. So it, so it has angels and demons mentioned exactly the same number wow, of times. That's so satisfying. Okay. It has um, the similitude of Adam to Jesus, the similarity between them. And it mentions them both 25 times in the entire Quran. I think it's in chapter four or seven, I can't remember, but where it says, where it compares the two, it mentions them exactly seven times up until that point. And yet they're mentioned in different, different uh, uh, you know, uh, parts of the Quran, basically. So when we look at these things, and there's so many other examples like this, you, you think to yourself, well, how does a man in a desert in the seventh century, through memory alone, random verses, events unfolding? So for example, somebody asks him a question, peace be upon him, and he lowers his head 
the verses are revealed. He gives the verses and he tells them where they must be placed within the book. And then you have all of these things happening that, that actually discovered centuries and centuries afterwards because there was no verse numbers at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They were introduced later. There were no chapter numbers. That was introduced later. It was all just memory, basically. So now the question arises, how do, and how for an Arab people, when they're challenged that this book cannot be equal, cannot be imitated, and the best poets, the best people of rhetoric, they admit, even many of whom don't accept, who don't accept Islam, who say these words are not the words of Muhammad, this is some sort of magic. Because the eloquence of the words, the use of the words, by the way, another phenomena, every chapter has a word, at least one word, that's unique to that chapter. It's not duplicated anywhere else in the Quran. Some chapters it's have- a made up word or? Uh, uh, no, a, a word. So an Arabic word is used in a particular chapter that's not duplicated again in any other chapter. Some chapters have three or four words that are not duplicated in any other chapter. So now the question arises, who was doing all the counting? When was this? When was it first? 14, 14 centuries ago. Now you have a very interesting book written by Professor Raymond Farin, an American guy who was studying linguistics and somebody said to him, look, you're studying classical Arabic poetry and what have you. Why don't you look, at the, look into the Quran? Because it seems very rhythmic as well. And so he looked into it. He became Muslim because he said the patterns, the structures within the Quran of, if you, if you understand literary patterns, things like chiasm, parallelism and concentrism, ring formations. So you might have, so for example, chapter two in the Quran is 286 verses and he divided it into nine equal parts. The first part is related to the ninth part, the second to the eighth, the third to the seventh, and in the middle, there's a unique, a unique message. Okay. One of the interesting things there is that in the 143rd verse out of the 286, Allah says, and I have chosen for you the middle ground, the middle way. And it's the first, only time that the word middle is used and it's in the middle. Now, no verse numbers, no chapter numbers. Yeah, that's true. That's very remarkable. And random verses coming down with events unfolding. And he, the Prophet, peace be upon him, is telling them where to put those verses within the entire corpus of the Quran. The literary aspects were also that at the time, Arabic was constructed of some 11 or 12 different grammatical rules of how you construct the structure of the language itself. When the Quran was revealed, it conformed to none of those structures. It was a unique way of writing the Arabic language. So the Arabs couldn't understand how a man who was known to be illiterate suddenly was coming with these verses, these words. It also introduced words and concepts that were never used before in the Arabic language, in, in, in Arabic, uh, um, um, lang in the Arabic language. Kind of so, so for example, Allah says, um, the owner of the day of judgment, Maliki Yawmiddin. The Arabs said, what is this Malik, owner of the day of judgment? We've never used this concept. We've never used these words in that way, yet it's so powerful because it's talking about abs absolute ownership of something, which we never would, or for example, Allah says uh, that I swear by time. And the Arab said, what is this concept of swearing by time itself? So now again, you have a, a man in the desert in the, fourth, in, the, in the seventh century, 1400 years ago, no literary skills, never known for his poetry or his eloquence or his writing. The first book is now constructed in the Arabic language, which is the Quran. And it has all of these, and, and I've just touched on the surface, by the way. That's really interesting. It's certainly a yeah. lot to think yeah. about. Yeah. I don't obviously know that much yeah. about the Quran, and like, I don't know where I would even find sure. excerpts or passages to kind of... So, uh, I would, uh, to, there's yeah. a really interesting um, website uh, mm -hmm. called Sapiens Institute. Yeah. And there's also aira.org. And there's a lot of free literature on those websites. Yeah. Um, from Western academics and from, you know, um, people of religion and what have you. 
you might find that quite interesting actually. But the, 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 the question that I would always ask people is that if, I, if what I told you is true, you'd have to at least, I think, accept that that is quite remarkable. It definitely is remarkable right? and I really appreciate your passion. Yeah. It's very intriguing yeah. to listen to you speak yeah. about it. Well, the reason I think the passion for me comes in is that, you know, through reason and through investigation, once you establish that actually, you know what, there's no other rational explanation for this and that it must be from God and it's a guidance to me to help me in this world and in the hereafter. I mean, I, I, that's a big thing I, to be it's passionate a very about. Way of thinking. I'm so cynical. I, I always try and find, I think you should be. be critical and look at it from the different you know what you, I love hearing yeah. perspectives like this. It's really. No, but you know, being critical is very good because I was mm. very, very critical as well. When I was born in this country, I thought to myself, well, I could be Muslim at home, I could be anything else outside, right? But I would only really follow the religion if I could reason through evidence. And I think for me, that was very important. It had to be more than just a, a, a loving story or a, a sweet story or something that sounded wonderful. It had to have a bit more substance and meaning. And that's why in Islam, we have this concept of using your intellect to recognize the truth and then we have what's called nakal, belief, to have belief. So I've never seen the angels, but I accept the angels exist because of the authority of the Quran telling me that they exist. But I establish first that the authority is worth trust, is trustworthy. Because if it's not, then it doesn't really matter, yeah. you see. And the Quran's done that and the, Quran well. said, <laughs> and the Quran's done it in, in, a, in such a, and I've literally just touched, skimmed the surface. Literally, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love learning about it, and I uh, teach a lot in the school, uh, school I work. Oh, nice. So okay. It's always nice to kind of get. What do you teach? So you teach RE, or you teach? Um, so I teach PSHE. Okay. Um, but obviously, we we do a lot about um, you know challenging assumptions. Sure, and, sure. Uh, Recognising different people. Sure, things, so sure. That's kind of what I wanted to wonder. Right, right. See what you're saying. But, no, no, it's good. Um, okay. No, it's it's really nice. So yeah. thank you for spending the time. No, no, it's it it a pleasure to meet you guys. You you look quite very cold. Freezing, yeah. I think yeah. I think yeah. I think I think you thought it'd be a nice day I'll today. Much. <laughs> right. much? Coats, no, 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 no. Oh my god. I actually went into Primark to get a hat. And they said, oh no, winter's over. So we've got all the spring stuff out yes. now. I said, you're joking. Yeah, yeah. I said, it's just have you seen how it's like outside, you know. So, do, I mean, do you believe in God at all yourself or what's your position on that? Are you agnostic, atheist? What I'm you... definitely agnostic. I really, I have those days where I really like to have that belief sure. that spoken about sure. and kind of come up with an explanation for why yeah. things happening. Yeah. Um, I just, I feel very critical of the time, suffering yeah. in the world yeah. always makes yeah. me very sceptical Yeah. Of, religion and yes. some of the opinions. But I definitely I definitely think religion, like whether you believe it or not, is such an amazing, powerful thing. Yes. And I just love the passion behind um, certain religious people I've met and how they how they seem to kind of like guide their way through life so well based on yeah. their beliefs. And yeah. I just I think it's really nice. Yeah. I wish I wish I could have some of that sometimes. So the thing is with the suffering sister, what I would say to you is that what if God told you that is how I've created the world, yeah. full of suffering, yeah. right? I've spoken to many people. Do you see my point? <laughs> well, yeah. Because I think what a lot of people do is they make a mistake. They say, well, if God is all good, then surely he would not create a world where there would be suffering. But that's an assumption. The assumption is that because of this, this has to happen. And what we would say is that Allah says in the Quran very clearly that do they say they will believe and then we won't test them? We will test you in, in, in poverty and in, and, and in wealth. We will test you with health and with illness, so that I life and death. I totally understand and I have no problem in free will and everything. Yeah. Um, I think it's when certain people from different religions proclaim this has happened, yes. people are bad people because of... So we're not allowed to do that in Islam? What they've done wrong. Okay, so in Islam, yeah, yeah, it's we, we believe that whenever a calamity befalls a people, it can be either because of their sins or it could be a test from Allah. Mm -hmm. And Allah does, say in the, Allah does say that Allah tests those uh, that he loves the most with the greatest tests. So the prophets actually were tested greatly. They, were, they suffered great persecution and great loss uh, and, and many problems. But that was because Allah 
uh, uh, says in the Quran that we will differentiate the, the, the truthful ones from the liars, from the ones who truly believe and are not shaken and still show gratitude for everything else that they have, uh, as opposed to those who, whose belief is weak and then they just turn their backs as soon as things get hard. So, 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 so that's the thing. And the thing is, you know, it's all about perspective as well. So if you're witnessing somebody's tummy being cut open and you know nothing about surgery, you might look at that as a very evil, bad, horrible act. But when the surgeon then explains to you that actually the, 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 the baby was trapped and it had to be released through a cesarean insection, right? Otherwise the mother would have died, the baby would have died. Then suddenly your perspective has now changed. What was a sharp instrument cutting open a woman was a horrible thing to see, but your perspective, because the knowledge has now changed, your perspective on that thing has changed as well. And so on the Day of Judgment, we believe Allah says that the person who has suffered the most in this world will be dipped into paradise for a blink of an eye. And then he'll be questioned. Did you see any suffering in this world? And he will say, I swear by you, my Lord, I saw no suffering in this world. So it's all about perspective. What seems for us a very long stretched out process of pain and suffering and, and, and what we see is evil, we're, we're told on the day of judgment that it will be just a blink of an eye. Your, your memory of it will be just almost gone. Just like when you were teething when you were young, you don't remember you were teething. Similarly, when you are uh, in the hereafter, the suffering, the pain, the anxiety, the problems you had will be just a blink of an eye because that's the afterlife, it's an eternal life. And so when people, are, when people are raised up on the Day of Judgment, they'll question one another. How long were you in the world for? And they will say perhaps a day, maybe part of a day, because it would seem so insignificant in comparison to the, the afterlife. But in terms of um, believing in a, in a God, I would say it's a very intuitive belief. That's why I think on a crashing plane, you don't find any atheists, right? They all say, if God, if you exist, save me. <laughs> because suddenly what we believe is that, we believe that every soul has been given a fitra, a, a predisposition to recognize God. And the worldly, and the, and the worldly um, affairs, whether it's materialism, whether it's our own anxieties or stresses or whatever, yeah. they cloud that fitra. And then suddenly when a, a really severe calamity potentially befalls you, Allah says in the Quran, for example, when the ocean, when you're in the sea, when you're in a boat and the waves are crashing over one another, who do you turn to but me? And then once again, when you're returned to safety, you become an open opponent to God again. In other words, that fitra is unclouded because an extreme event has just unfolded, right? And then when we get distracted with life again, we sort of forget God again. And yeah, so I, I would say as well, what you're saying about everyone has the innate ability to be yes. God. I would automatically think that everyone has the innate ability within them to believe in a purpose and believe yes. in, a, yes. in a guided principle. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, so, good, so, so, you know, the fact that you would recognize even though you might be agnostic, but you'd be able to recognize good from evil is something that we would say that Allah has placed in your heart, yeah, right? Yeah. Because otherwise, genetically, i.e. just through evolution, many of the values that we have actually don't line up to the, uh, evolutionary success in terms of, you know, uh, survival of the fittest. You know, looking after your old parents is out of compassion and love but that's, it, it's not helping survival of the fittest. Actually, what you're doing is you're, you're making people survive, survive who perhaps are the, Ill, the most ill, the, the most perhaps needy of perhaps, you know, of, of, of draining resources so, and money. Also probably the wisest. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, knowledge but, is absolutely. No, I agree, but then that's more of a, it's more of a moral decision that we're making, um, which in, in reality within, within, within pure genetics, it, it doesn't make sense to look after, for example, somebody with Down syndrome. But of course we would, out of love and compassion for that individual, we would do that, right? But as Dawkins said, Dawkins, you know, in his, in his very sort of infamous uh, tweet or, or, or post said that we should be getting rid of these people. 
uh, you know, aborting them. We shouldn't even even allow because they're just a drain on resources. But but I think. How much love is that going to bring into the world? Well, exactly, and I think that well, that's where the natural progression to atheism can lead to. It can lead to nihilism, because ultimately, if your and his and my atoms are simply just a rearrangement of carbon atoms rearranged differently, then there's no value difference between this person or me and the rock. Because, that, because those atoms have been simply orchestrated or, or, or assembled in a different way to mine, right? But clearly we don't see the value of a rock to a human being as being the same. So there's something above pure mechanics, let's say, that we would look at in order to come to that conclusion, you know? But in terms of a creator, why I would say it's a very intuitive uh, belief is that if we look at this universe, we can see that it exists. And we can see that it's contingent. It relies on certain things being there for the universe to exist or have a chance to exist. So you need, you know, strong forces of uh, uh, weak and strong nuclear forces, for example, uh, for, for pr protons and electrons to even function so there can be basic chemistry, so there can be biological life, all these things, right? And the universe could have been assembled differently. So it requires an explanation. And what you can't have is an infinite series of material explanations. Because if there was an infinite number of steps to traverse, you and I would not be having this conversation. Because you can never traverse an infinite. What do you mean? So I'll give you an example. Sorry. So let me give you an example. If today's step was, say, this step here that we meet in in time and space and we have this conversation. If you had to traverse an infinite series of steps, reaching this particular step, you couldn't do it. Because for example, if you're in the army, what's your name, sorry? Uh, Owen. Owen, Owen, Abbas, yeah? And Alex. Alex, yeah? So Owen, you're in the army and you have a gun in your hand and you say, Sergeant, can I take the shot? I'll be your sergeant, yeah, I'll be in charge of you, yeah? I said, wait, hold on a second, I have to ask my superior. He then has to ask his superior. And that went on infinitely. Would you ever take the shot? No, because you can't traverse an infinite, right? So what we would argue is that there has to be a beginning of everything, that it itself is the explanation for itself, and it can't have a beginning. Because if it had a beginning, it requires an explanation, and then that requires an explanation, and that requires, so you can't have the infinite regress. And we would say, this thing, whatever this thing is, clearly very powerful, because it's brought this universe into existence. Okay, it's designed and fashioned biology and chemistry and everything else. Has to be very powerful, very intelligent. Has to decide when to bring things into existence. And that sounds a lot like an almighty being, an almighty creator, the first cause. And so we would say it's a very intuitive thing. And this is why the Quran addresses this question very beautifully. Allah says in the Quran, did this universe create itself? So Allah is asking you the question directly, Owen and Alex, that think, contemplate about this. If the universe can't give birth to itself, then where did it come from? And ultimately, it has to come from something that it, it itself is eternal, pre and post eternal, cannot have a beginning. And it is the explanation for itself. It doesn't require an explanation from outside of it. And so one, once one sort of comes to that conclusion, then one can come forward to revelation and other things and, you know, look into that. That, that is the, the tough one, isn't it? Because I always think from a scientific perspective, you just go pulsating universe. Um, just well, matter. yeah, so it is what it is, and it's just yes. having the big bang contracting over and over. But apparently, but if you if you if you read do a little bit of research, even the pulsating universe requires a first a, a first mover. Mm -hmm. It requires a first cause. Which is so difficult. Yeah, it's difficult. The to other explain thing, the, the, the other thing is this: that when we look at our universe, things at the outer reaches of our universe are moving. Up away from the center of where the, we presume the Big Bang was, faster than the speed of light. So we know that that, that process could not have been happen, happening infinitely through history, through time. 
Otherwise, there'd be no stars left in the universe, basically. Everything would have just simply moved apart. So we know that there's some sort of finite time because we can still see stars. And we know that in trillions of years, if the universe was to continue, that the stars would actually disappear eventually. And so from what we can see, things are actually accelerating, not decelerating, that we could even presume that they could perhaps return back to a singularity. But in any case, the singularity itself is contingent because it has certain things assembled in a certain way that they could be assembled differently. And you, without helium and hydrogen and all of these things, there's no, un, there's no universe, right? Without strong nuclear forces, weak nuclear forces, you know, you don't have chemistry, biology. So from all of this, what we can actually see is that it seems more plausible, it seems more reasonable to say that this was brought into existence by something and whatever that initial something was, it couldn't have had a big, it could not have had a beginning. But it's very powerful. And it's very intelligent. It's incredibly beyond our imagination of capability and capacity. You see, and then of course we find evidence that this creator has communicated with us, and there's a lot of evidence to support that this actually is from the creator. So it sort of all ties into yeah, yeah. As, as a holistic uh, message. I think there's no. For me, there's no like, you know, people say to me, what's that one thing you could say to me that would make me believe in God? Yeah. I, think, I think it's not like that. I think it's a very, it's an accumulative thing. Just like you might have accumulative reasons to accept a particular notion. You, I'm, I've never been to Australia, but I accept Australia exists. I'm pretty convinced that it exists, right? Because obviously there's an accumulation of, of, of evidence. It could be testimony, valid testimony, photographs, it could be satellite images. It could be all of this stuff put together, you know, that would convince me that Australia probably does exist, right? And in the same way, I would say it's an accumulation of evidence. When we look at the argument from contingency, when we look at, you know, do things just come into existence from nothing? Um, the, could the Quran have simply been a work of a genius? You know, what, when I look at it, could a genius even come up with, for example, prophecies? The Quran makes prophecies about, there's a chapter called Surah Rome, Rome. And it talks about the Byzantine Empire and the, uh, the, the Byzantine Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. And the Persians at that time inflict a very, very heavy defeat upon the Byzantines, upon the Romans. The Quran makes a prediction. Allah says within three to nine years, the Romans would once again be victorious. And people thought this was a very counterintuitive claim because the Persian and Roman Empire eventually both collapse from the Islamic Empire. So that could have happened before the prophecy came to, to, to fruition. The Persians actually could have gone and just finished off the, the Romans because they were on the brink of dying out. That didn't happen. Exactly as the Quran predicted that in fact the Romans will once again be victorious. Uh, listen, it's so lovely to yeah. listen. Uh, it's freezing, I know. I know. It was, it was really nice. I think <laughs> you need a, you need a big you. coat. I won't yeah, shake your hand, know. sister, because in Islam, we're not allowed to touch um, uh, any woman who's not our wife, daughter, sister, or mother. That's okay. Yeah. And that's out of respect. Mm -hmm. It's not because of a value thing or anything else. Mm -hmm. It's out of, uh, out, out of respect for our sisters that we don't physically touch them. So no I just want to apologize for that, but just not, please don't take any offense yeah, by that. High five, <laughs> <laughs> it was lovely to meet you guys. Lovely Have a lovely, you. lovely day. Bye. Alhamdulillah, that was a really nice conversation. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a real pleasure because when you end up talking to people who are much like open-minded uh, and they're looking into religion, finding out what people believe, uh, it can turn into a really fruitful discussion. May Allah inshallah guide uh, the sister and the brother, uh, uh, pray for them, uh, because that's the whole point of us coming here that, you know, we just want to give the message and the hidayah guidance comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But mashallah, lovely couple, it was a really nice conversation. Uh, and I think that uh, the sister and the brother both uh, were nodding away um, when they acknowledged that some of the things that we were discussing, I think were quite profound, alhamdulillah. Uh, remember us in your dua and please support our work. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.